There has never been a book like this on the subject of suffering. And sometimes our Bible reading suffers because we pick at it and have a little nibble here and a little bite there, and we don't get the whole flow of the Word of God. And in a sense, I'd almost you rather listen to some extended readings from the book of Job and then go home uh, than skip some of the wonderful passages in this book. I'd like some time to have it read dramatically right through at one sitting. Then you get the whole impact of the story. But I've chosen some representative passages that will give you the whole setting. We begin then at chapter 1. There lived in the land of Uz a man named Job, a good man who feared God and stayed away from evil. He had a large family of seven sons and three daughters and was immensely wealthy for he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, 500 female donkeys and employed many servants. He was in fact the richest cattleman in that entire area. Every year when each of Job's sons had a birthday, he invited his brothers and sisters to his home for a celebration. And on these occasions they would eat and drink with great merriment. When those birthday parties ended, and sometimes they lasted several days, Job would summon his children to him and sanctify them, getting up early in the morning and offering a burnt offering for each of them. For Job said, Perhaps my sons have sinned and turned away from God in their hearts. And this was Job's regular practice. One day as the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, Satan, the accuser, came with them. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan, and Satan replied, From patrolling the earth. Then the Lord asked Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth, a good man who fears his God and will have nothing to do with evil. Why shouldn't he when you pay him so well, Satan scoffed. You have always protected him and his home and his property from all harm. You have prospered everything he does. Look how rich he is. No wonder he worships you. But just take away his wealth, wealth and you'll see him curse you to your face. And the Lord replied to Satan, You may do anything you like with his wealth, but don't harm him physically. So Satan went away, and sure enough, not long afterwards, when Job's sons and daughters were dining at the oldest brother's house, tragedy struck. A messenger rushed to Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing, with the donkeys feeding beside them, when the Sabians raided us, drove away the animals, and killed all the farmhands except me. I am the only one left. While this messenger was still speaking, another arrived with more bad news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all the herdsmen, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Before this man finished, still another messenger rushed in. Three bands of Chaldeans have driven off your camels and killed your servants, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And as he was still speaking, another arrived to say, Your sons and daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and engulfed the house so that the roof fell in on them, and all are dead, and I alone escaped to tell you. Then Job stood up and tore his robe in grief and fell down upon the ground before God. I came naked from my mother's womb, he said, and I shall have nothing when I die. The Lord gave me everything I had, and they were his to take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or revile God. Now the angels came again to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan with them. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. From patrolling the earth, Satan replied. Well, have you noticed my servant Job? The Lord asked. He is the finest man in all the earth, a good man who fears God and turns away from all evil. And he has kept his faith in me, despite the fact that you persuaded me to harm him without any cause. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give anything to save his life, touch his body with sickness, and he will curse you to your face. Do with him as you please, the Lord replied, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with a terrible case of boils from head to foot. 
Then Job took a broken piece of pottery to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still trying to be godly when God has done all this to you? Curse him and die. But he replied, You talk like some heathen woman. What, shall we receive only pleasant things from the hand of God and never anything unpleasant? So in all this, Job said nothing wrong. When three of Job's friends heard of all the tragedy that had befallen him, they got into touch with each other and traveled from their homes to comfort and console him. Their names were Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite. Job was so changed that they could hardly recognize him. Wailing loudly in despair, they tore their robes and threw dust into the air and put earth on their heads to demonstrate their sorrow. Then they sat upon the ground with him silently for seven days and nights, no one speaking a word, for they saw that his suffering was too great for words. At last Job spoke and cursed the day of his birth. Let the day of my birth be damned, he said, and the night when I was conceived. Let that day be forever forgotten. Let it be lost even to God, shrouded in eternal darkness. Yes, let the darkness claim it for its own, and may a black cloud overshadow it. May it be blotted off the calendar, never again to be counted among the days of of the month of that year. Let that night be bleak and joyless. Let those who are experts at cursing curse it. Let the stars of that night disappear. Let it long for light, but never see it. Never see the morning light. Curse it for its failure to shut my mother's womb. For letting me be born to come to all this trouble. Why didn't I die at birth? Why did the midwife let me live? Why did she nurse me at her breasts? For if only I had died at birth, then I would be quiet now, asleep and at rest. Along with prime ministers and kings, with all their pomp and wealthy princes, whose castles are full of rich treasures, oh, to have been stillborn, to have never breathed or seen the light. For there in death the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. There even prisoners are at ease, with no brutal jailer to curse them. Both rich and poor alike are there, and the slave is free at last from his master. Oh, why should light and life be given to those in misery and bitterness, who long for death and it won't come, who search for death as others search for food or money? What blessed relief when at last they die. Why is a man allowed to be born if God is only going to give him a hopeless life of uselessness and frustration? I cannot eat for sighing. My groans pour out like water. What I always feared has happened to me. I was not fat and lazy, yet trouble struck me down. Now, at that point, Job's three friends, Job's comfort, as we call them, came and they said to Job one thing. They said, you know, you must have been a terrible man for this to happen. You must have done something terribly bad to suffer like this. What have you done to deserve this? And he kept saying, I have not done the things that deserve this suffering. And it was true. But in chapter 31, there is a wonderful protest of innocence from this man. They've been telling him what a terrible sinner he must have been, worse than anybody else. And in chapter 31, he makes a wonderful statement, not boasting, justifying himself on his own goodness. Yes, he was doing that, and he could do it because he was a good man. Listen. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look with lust upon a girl. I know full well that Almighty God above sends calamity on those who do. He sees everything I do and every step I take. If I have lied and deceived, but God knows that I am innocent, or if I have stepped off God's pathway, or if my heart has lusted for what my eyes have seen, or if I am guilty of any other sin, then let someone else reap the crops I have sown, and let all that I have planted be rooted out. Or if I have longed for another man's wife, then may I die. And may my wife be in another man's home and someone else become her husband. For lust is a shameful sin, a crime that should be punished. It is a devastating fire that destroys to hell and would root out all I have planted. 
If I have been unfair to my servants, how could I face God? What could I say when he questioned me about it? For God made me and made my servant too. He created us both. If I have hurt the poor, or caused widows to weep, or refused food to hungry orphans, but we have always cared for orphans in our home, treating them as our own children. Or if I have seen anyone freezing and not given him clothing or fleece from my sheep to keep him warm, or if I have taken advantage of an orphan because I thought I could get away with it, if I have done any of these things, then let my arm be torn from its socket. Let my shoulder be wrenched out of place. Rather that than face the judgment sent by God that I dread more than anything else. For if the majesty of God opposes me, what hope is there? If I have put my trust in money, if my happiness depends on wealth, or if I have looked at the sun shining in the skies or the moon walking down her silver pathway and my heart has been secretly enticed and I have worshipped them by kissing my hand to them, this too must be punished by the judges. For if I had done such things, it would mean that I denied the God of heaven. If I rejoiced at harm to an enemy, but actually I have never cursed anyone nor asked for revenge, or if any of my servants have ever gone hungry, actually I have never turned away even a stranger, but have opened my doors to all. Or if, like Adam, I have tried to hide my sins, fearing the crowd and its contempt, so that I refuse to acknowledge my sin and do not go out of my way to help others. Oh, that there was someone who would listen to me and try to see my side of this argument. Look, I will sign my signature to my defense. Now let the Almighty show me that I am wrong. Let him approve the indictments made against me by my enemies. I would treasure it like a crown. Then I would tell him exactly what I have done and why, presenting my defense as one he listens to. Or if my land accuses me because I stole the fruit it bears, or if I have murdered its owners to get their land for myself, then let thistles grow on that land instead of wheat, and weeds instead of barley. Job's words are ended. Now we turn to the end of the book. Chapter 38, a few verses from there. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, Why are you using your ignorance to deny my providence? Now get ready to fight, for I am going to demand some answers from you. And you must reply, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Do you know how its dimensions were determined and who did the surveying? What supports its foundations and who laid its cornerstone? As the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who decreed the boundaries of the seas when they gushed from the depths? Who clothed them with clouds and thick darkness and barred them by limiting their shores? and said thus far, and no farther shall you come, and here shall your proud waves stop. Have you ever once commanded the morning to appear, and caused the dawn to rise in the east? Have you ever told the daylight to spread to the ends of the earth to end the night's wickedness? Have you ever robed the dawn in red, and disturbed the haunts of wicked men, and stopped the arm raised to strike? Have you explored the springs from which the seas come, or walked in the sources of their depths? Has the location of the gates of death been revealed to you? <clears throat> Do you realize the extent of the earth? Tell me about it, if you know. Where does the light come from, and how do, how do you get there? Or tell me about the darkness, where does it come from? Can you find its boundaries, or go to its source? But of course you know all this for you were born before it was all created, and you are so very experienced. In other words, God is saying, Job, do you want to know the answer to every question? Do you think you're going to be God? Chapter 40, the Lord went on, do you still want to argue with the Almighty, or will you yield? Do you, God's critic, have the answers? Then Job replied to God, I am nothing. How could I ever find the answers? 
I lay my hand upon my mouth in silence. I have said too much already. Then the Lord spoke to Job again from the whirlwind. Stand up like a man and brace yourself for battle. Let me ask you a question and give me the answer. Are you going to discredit my justice and condemn me so that you can say you are right? Are you as strong as God and can you shout as loudly as he? All right, then put on your robes of state, your majesty and splendor. Give vent to your anger. Let it overflow against the proud. Humiliate the haughty with a glance. Tread down the wicked where they stand. Knock them into the dust stone-faced in death. If you can do that, then I'll agree with you that your own strength can save you. So the final chapter, chapter 42. Then Job replied to God, I know that you can do anything and that no one can stop you. You ask who it is who has so foolishly denied your providence. It is I. I was talking about things I knew nothing about and did not understand, things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will speak. Let me put the question to you, see if you can answer them. But now I say, I had heard about you before, but now I have seen you. And I loathe myself and repent in dust and ashes. After the Lord had finished speaking with Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and with your two friends, for you have not been right in what you have said about me as my servant Job was. Now take seven young bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer a burnt offering for yourselves, and my servant Job will pray for you and I will accept his prayer on your behalf and won't destroy you as I should because of your sin, your failure to speak rightly concerning my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuite and Zophar the Naamathite did as the Lord commanded them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer on their behalf. Then, when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his wealth and happiness. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before. Then all of his brothers, sisters, and former friends arrived and feasted with him in his home consoling him for all his sorrow and comforting him because of all the trials the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them brought him a gift of money and a gold ring. So the Lord blessed Job at the end of his life more than at the beginning. For now he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand teams of oxen and a thousand female donkeys. God also gave him seven more sons and three more daughters. These were the names of his daughters, Jemima, Keziah, and Karen. And in all the land there were no other girls, as lovely as the daughters of Job. And their father put them into his will, along with their brothers. Job lived a hundred and forty years after that, living to see his grandchildren, and great-grandchildren too. Then at last he died, an old, old man, after living a long, good life life. You must go home sometime and read that whole story. What a story. How that man in all his natural passion cried out against God and argued with God and said, God, Job, you're just a man. You shouldn't be arguing like this. You're trying to put me in the wrong so you can be in the right. Job, you must leave the answer with me. And the secret of the whole story is this. Job never knew why God allowed him to suffer. He never knew. But he came to the point where he believed that God knew and he was prepared to leave the answer with God. That's the secret. And I have never met anyone yet who conquered suffering properly, who hadn't come to that same point. I don't know why, but I believe God does and I'm going to trust him. So many people ask me about this question of suffering and it's one of the subjects I feel least qualified to take. Though I have spoken about this at one or two house groups over the last year. But let me say straight away that I have not suffered as many people I have known have suffered. 
I've had my fair share of illness and hospitalization. I've known what it is to have personal tragedy within the immediate family circle. But the thing that puzzles me most is why I haven't suffered more. And I find that many saints feel the same way. Their problem is not why they suffer, but why they don't suffer more. Considering what we've done to God, it amazes me that we have as much health as we do. But as a minister for 20 years, I've seen an awful lot of suffering, perhaps second only to doctors and nurses. Ministers see as much pain and weariness and suffering of one kind or another as any other profession. And sometimes after an afternoon's visiting, having been to see many people in suffering, I come home having to go back to God to get my stability of thinking because I found that my mind was asking why, why? Now the problem of suffering won't be ignored. Sooner or later the shadow of suffering is cast across every path. But since it usually waits until we are old enough to bear it, Young people don't think about this subject a great deal. Life is still good, they are still fit and strong and healthy, and so in a sense the young people here tonight may feel that this is a rather morbid subject or a subject that they're not terribly interested in. Mark my words, another 20 years you'll be glad to hear a sermon on this subject. It won't be ignored because every life sooner or later suffers in one way or another, but it mustn't be exaggerated. I know that some people really do seem to go through it one trouble after another. But let's not forget that for every part of our body that goes wrong, there are still hundreds that go right. And though we do or become very conscious of ill health when we are ill, we should be also very conscious of good health when we've got it, but we're not. We take it for granted. Furthermore, television is now throwing at us the suffering of a whole world in such large doses that I think many of us are becoming almost immune to it. We've seen pictures of starving Biafran children so often now that we almost switch off mentally when we see another. And we hear about millions of people and preachers are rather too prone to talk about the numbers who don't go to bed with a square meal tonight and all this kind of thing. Let me say that the problem of suffering is no bigger than one person's suffering. One child starving is as bad as three million starving to that child. And we must get this in proportion. It's not a problem that multiplies in numbers. It is an essentially individual problem. And furthermore, I'm going to admit freely right at the beginning that it's a problem that can't be explained. It won't be ignored. It mustn't be exaggerated, and it can't be explained. If I gave you a cheap, slick answer to this question, why does God allow suffering tonight, I would be betraying my Lord. There is no cheap, slick answer in the Bible. And since my job in this pulpit is to preach what the Bible says and nothing else, then I must not give you a slick answer too, and dismiss it as if it's no mystery. There is a mystery in suffering. And in the last analysis, the answers that I'm going to try and give tonight do not take us far enough to know the whole answer. But I believe that God has said quite a lot, and that if we hold on to what he has said, we can go as far as we need to go to cope with this problem. May I begin this way? It is only a problem to those who already believe three things about God. And if ever anyone says to me, why does God allow suffering? I say, if you really sincerely mean that question, if it is a, a question in your mind, and not just a clever thrust at the Christian, if you really do ask this question, then you and I believe three things in common already before we begin. First of all, we both believe in one God. There is no problem if there are many gods. Because if there are many gods, well, then these may be good and those may be bad. There is no problem. Suffering is only a problem to those who believe in one God. And it's interesting that in areas of the world where they believe in many gods, this question is never asked. So first of all, you and I must believe in one God. Second, we must believe in an almighty God. Because only if God in heaven is almighty and can stop suffering is it a problem. 
But if God is not almighty and if God is as helpless as we are and God says, well, I do sympathize, but I can't do anything, I'm afraid, there is no problem. But it is because we believe that God is almighty and can stop things that it's a problem. And therefore, a person who asks this question believes in one God, so do I, in an almighty God, so do I, and that that God is love. Because if God is hate, then there's no problem. If God loves bullying people, if God loves hurting people, there is no problem. But if God is love, then of course there is a problem because you say, if I love people, I wouldn't do that to them. So we at least start on common ground. We believe in one God who is almighty and loving. That is the problem. If there is only one God and he's almighty and loving, why does he allow this? If we loved someone, we wouldn't do it, so we say. Well, now, what is the cause of suffering? I want to give you three answers that have been given by the philosophers and thinkers, one of which is the Bible answer. The first answer, which is not, is that suffering is due to the imperfection of the world in which we live. Putting it very simply, when God made the world, he made a bad job. That if he'd made the world properly, there would have been no famines, no earthquakes, no typhoons, no volcanoes. There would have been none of these things. And that in fact we suffer because God made an imperfect world. Now that I cannot believe is the answer. Because I read in my Bible that when God finished the world and the work of his hands, he looked at it, he said, that's very good. And you couldn't have said that about an imperfect, badly done job. I do not believe that the cause of sin is imperfection of the universe in which we live. The second answer that philosophers have given is this, that suffering is due to the ignorance of men. Now I can see the force of this argument because if only men would spend as much money on cancer research as they do on getting to the moon, we might be much nearer the answer. And if only this country would spend as much on medical research as it does on defense, the strides we would have made and the things that would be obliterated as TB and other things are almost forgotten things in this land of ours now. Many other things would be history if we did. Now, I can understand that our ignorance causes suffering and now that we know more about certain things, we can relieve suffering. I am astonished as a regular hospital visitor to find treatment changing almost overnight. Things being done for people now that just wouldn't be done. A lady said to me in a hospital ward only this week, I said to her, 20 years ago, there'd be no hope for you. She said, 10 years ago, there wouldn't. And we thank God together for the understanding that has come to the doctors and surgeons and has helped to relieve suffering. But I do not believe that ignorance is the cause of suffering. I think that knowledge can relieve it but I don't think that ignorance is the cause of it. What then is the cause of suffering according to this book? The answer can be stated in a simple sentence. All suffering is due to sin. That's the biblical position. All suffering is due to sin. But having said that, I must stop you immediately from jumping to the wrong conclusion and quoting me wrongly afterwards. Wouldn't be the first time I'd been quoted wrongly, but I, I would hate you to get this one wrong. I do not therefore mean that if a person suffers, they must have sinned. The book of Job is the answer to that one, and we can nail that one now. I have seen some of the saintliest and godliest people on earth suffer terribly and I've seen some of the most wicked die peacefully in their beds of old age. You can't just equate suffering with the sin in the individual's life, but taking the whole suffering of the whole world and of the whole human race, the Bible says all that is due to one thing and one only, sin. It's not due to the imperfection of the universe in which we live. It's not due to the ignorance of men. It's due to sin. But whose sin? Now, we can divide this question up into three, and I hope I'm not trying to make this into a lecture or be too academic. I realize I'm dealing with very human and emotional subjects, 
As somebody had said, to those who think life is a comedy, to those who feel life is a tragedy. And I realize that there are feelings here. But I'm trying to be objective so that you've got something to think about to begin to build on. There are three sources of sin which cause suffering to human beings. First of all, there is some suffering undoubtedly that comes to an individual because of their own sin. And I find no questions are asked about this, no problem is raised. Here is a man who has drunk his liver to bits or smoked his lungs to bits. And he knows it's the result of what he's done. And he is now suffering. Here is a girl who thought that stiletto heels were stylish and now at 40 she's living in the chiropodist surgery. And oh my, how her feet suffer. But she has done something that has produced suffering later. And the Bible is quite clear that whatever we sow we shall reap and that young people should not think they can sow their wild oats and get away with it later in life. A great deal of the suffering that I come up against in later life, one can see, is related to the way that life has been lived earlier. Now there is no problem here. If a man has played the fool and he pays the bill later, then that is surely a straightforward thing. God gave him the most delicate machine to look after. And is there any machine more delicate and more wonderfully balanced than this body which we have? And God gave it to us to use properly. Isn't it strange that princes and kings and clowns that caper in sawdust rings and ordinary folk like you and me are builders of eternity and each is given a bag of tools, an hourglass and a book of rules and each must build ere his time has flown a stumbling block or a stepping stone. You've been given a wonderful machine. If you suffer later because of sins earlier, then there's no problem with that. Now the second cause of suffering is this. A very great deal of the suffering in the world is caused by the sins of other people. War is the most outstanding example of this. Aggression and cruelty leave in their wake thousands upon thousands of millions of people suffering. That, by the way, does not say that it's wrong to fight because no one can ever say what suffering would have been left if it hadn't been fought. But the simple fact is that if I sin, I am likely to cause someone else to suffer. And if this nation sins, that nation will suffer. Now that's the second cause of suffering and as I look out upon the suffering of the world today, I can see that a vast proportion of it is due to the sins of others. The United Nations Food Organization says that there is enough food in the world for everybody if we'd only share it out properly. And the suffering caused by shortage of food could have been avoided. It is the sin and selfishness of men that is stopping the food distribution. God kept his part, seed time and harvest, summer and winter have not failed over the whole world. Of course there have been local failures, but God promised this to the whole earth. And what he's given to the whole earth would have been enough. But there is still an area, a third area of suffering that doesn't seem related to one's own sin or the sins of others. There are such things as earthquakes which seem quite unrelated to the sins of men or society. What about these? This is the nub of the problem and this is the heart of the question. Why does this kind of suffering come? And the Bible again gives an answer. The answer is that Satan's sin has caused it. Now I can imagine somebody immediately saying, now there they are, the easy one out. If you want someone to blame, there's the little old imp with his forked uh, spear and his forked tail and his horns. You blame everything you can't explain on him. That's not the question. The question is, is there such a person as the devil who could do this? In other words, if there is such a person, then this is not a scapegoat. This is not an explanation trying to evade the facts. This is a straight, truthful explanation. And the Bible is quite clear that Satan himself has sinned, that you can add all together the sin of the human race, and it's still not all the sin in the universe. 
You can add all the selfishness of every man, woman, and child on earth, and you still haven't got to the total of sin, because sin extends beyond the human race. And there are intelligent beings in the universe who have also sinned, apart altogether from the human race, and at their head, Satan. Not a little black imp, but a most subtle creature of God, a superhuman, intelligent being who hates God. And his sin is causing the overspill. Jesus himself accepted that explanation. When a woman was brought to him who had been ill for 18 years, Jesus said, you see this woman bound by Satan these 18 years. And in the book of Job, we are told that even though Job did not know, his suffering was the work of Satan. Now then, we can ask and try and answer the question, why does God allow suffering? We break it into three parts. Why does he allow me to suffer for my own sin? Why does he allow me to suffer for other people's sin? And why does he allow me to suffer for Satan's sin? And we'll have to give a different answer to each. First of all, why does he allow me, JDP, to suffer if I sin? The answer is because he disciplines me because it's the only way to teach hard old me, because it's the only way to chastise his child. There is a story told in the life of my grandfather, who died when I was four, so I don't know him, of a, a Durham miner called Geordie. And one day, Geordie's fellow workers said, Geordie, why does God allow pain? And Geordie said, thank God for pain. And they said, what? Thank God for pain. Yes, he said, thank God for pain. He said, one night I came home so drunk I couldn't stand. And he said, I fell right into the fire and the fire was lit. And he said, if it hadn't been for pain, I wouldn't be here now. Thank God for pain. Well, it's only a simple illustration. But God allows us to suffer for our own sin that he might teach us and warn us and pull us up. If we got away with it, if we never suffered when we did wrong, can you imagine what would happen to us? What kind of a world we'd live in? I have no problem at all in my mind as to why God allows me to suffer for my sin. So we move to the second one. Why does God allow me to suffer for somebody else's? That's a deeper question. And when we give it a little thought, I think we can see why. I think I can, and I hope I can share it with you. Either God made would have made us as separate individuals, each living on our own desert island, or he could make us in such a way that we were related to each other and could help and love each other. But if he did, then he would make us so that we could hurt each other. Now, there's a very quick way of getting peace in our house sometimes, and that is to send each child to a different bedroom. It gets peace very quickly. I'm quite sure that some of you parents have found the same method because I can see from your faces. Go to your bedroom and you go to that one and stay there until you can learn to live together. After a bit, they come back and they come back together. But being together, they can hurt each other, they can fight. Now, if we wanted permanent peace in our house, all we would need to do would be to separate our children permanently, keep them in separate rooms. Then we could visit them as their parents and love them. And they could love us, but we just keep them away from each other. Do you think that's what we wanted when we had children? Do you think that's what a family is meant to be? Now, do you realize that when God created men and women, he wanted a family, not just individuals loving him? That's why there's no such thing as private Christianity. He's not interested just in your private prayers. He wants you to learn to love one another, to be a family. God wants a family, not a lot of individuals, each in their own house praying, but people who come together as a family and love each other. And so God said, I will have to put these people together so they can love one another, but that means they can hurt each other. Would you have it any different? Would you rather God kept us away from each other so that we couldn't even love and help and be kind? I can see why God allowed us to hurt each other, because he wanted a family. I can see why God allows us to suffer for someone else's sins, because he also wants us to learn to love someone else. But the real problem comes when we ask, why does God allow suffering as a result of Satan's sin? The answer is, we may never know until we get to glory. 
But the answer also is, God knows. He knows. I'll never forget hearing from a dear old man called Mr. Tulip Scott, only man I ever knew with the name of a flower. And um, he wasn't like that at all. He wasn't a pansy. He was a, a real man. But um, I was talking to Mr. Scott once. He was then in his mid-70s. And he said, look at my face. He said, do you see anything funny about my face? Now, that's quite a question to ask. And, and uh, I sensed thin ice. So I walked very, very carefully and <laughs> sort of said, well, no. <laughs> he said, no, go on. Look, do you see anything unusual about my face? Now, I said, he said, do you know what my earliest memory of life is? He said, the earliest memory I have is of my mother taking a piece of rope and tying my hands together and tying my hands to my legs and tying my legs together. And he said, I remember struggling and fighting as she tied me up with rope. But he said, it wasn't till much later that he said, I learned that I had smallpox. And she did this to stop me scratching and making marks for life all over my face. And I knew later, years later, that she did it because she loved me. And Tulip Scott told me that that's how he came to think of suffering. The kind of suffering that God allows Satan to do. We may know in this life years later, we may not know till the next life. Many people don't. But to think that somebody does know and that somebody is allowing it for a reason. Now I have seen many of the reasons given at the time or shortly after. I know that some people have been brought to their senses by suffering. I think of a businessman in America who spent all his life in trains. He never slept in a bed so that he could start business the next morning until one day polio struck and he was put in a bath chair. And he said, thank God for polio because it brought him up with a jerk and there lying down on his back he could only look up and think about God. He became a godly man. Though he didn't make as much money, he became a man who was much more help to other people. So he said, thank God for polio. I can think of those whose characters have been refined and sweetened and made tender by suffering. God has had his reasons. Mind you, I can think of those who are made hard and bitter and resentful. It was Mrs. Hudson Taylor, I think, who became blind towards the end of her life and someone said to her, why should you, after all those years of service, doing things for the Lord and for other people, why should he let this happen to you? And she sweetly replied, I suppose he wants to put the finishing touches to my character. The people I know who've come to terms with suffering, not just resigned to it, not just giving themselves up to it, not just saying, well, there are others worse off than me, but those who see in it something positive, something that can be creative, are those who come to the position where they say, I cannot understand, but I believe God has a reason for doing this. And that's the position Job came to. He never did know that God was proving a point, a point which has lasted 4,000 years. And Job still speaks to our condition as no other sufferer speaks. God said to Satan, there is a man who loves me for my own sake. And Satan said, he doesn't. He loves you because he's healthy, because he's wealthy, because he's happy. You take those away and he'll curse you. And God said, all right, I'm going to let you do it to this man. And I'm going to demonstrate for the rest of history that there's one man who loved me for my own sake. It was a struggle over months. Job cursed the day he was born. He never cursed God. He cursed everything else. Even his own wife let him down. At the crucial point of his suffering, his wife lost her faith in God. But he struggled through until he came to the point where he said, God, I shouldn't have been speaking. I shouldn't have been arguing. You must have a good reason for this or you wouldn't be God. So I'm not going to talk about it anymore. And then God turned his fortunes. The case had been proved. And we know that at least one man could love God for God's sake. There have been many others since. I must finish. There are two final things that I want to say. The Christian looks at the problem of suffering in the light of two facts which other people don't think about. And it's very interesting to listen to the comfort that is given to sufferers by people who are not Christians. It is helpful as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough. The two facts 
that alter a Christian's thinking about suffering are these. First of all, the suffering in the next world. This is a most solemn and serious subject. But the Bible states that there are many people who will suffer more in the next world than they ever suffered in this. I am astonished how often at funerals people assume that the person who has died is at peace. It can be a delusion. And we have got to face the fact that Jesus saw weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth in the next world. But for the Christian, the next world is a world free from all suffering. And one day when we wake up in that new world, the suffering of this world will be like a bad dream. Paul says, I do not count this momentary light affliction as worth comparing to the eternal glory that will be revealed. He said, I've been flogged, I've been stoned, I've been left for dead, I've been through it all. And I've got a messenger of Satan, a thorn in the flesh, a physical handicap that's with me all the time. But he said, I count this momentary light affliction as nothing compared with the glory that's to be revealed. In other words, if you really do believe in another world in which there is no suffering, the suffering of this world looks much smaller and much shorter. If this world is the only life that you believe in, then frankly, suffering is a terrible thing, especially because it comes towards the end of life on the whole, when there is no future to believe in, and you can see how terrible it must be to see nothing in the future but suffering to the end. And I have known some sufferers in their older years who already had one foot in glory and who saw even the suffering of the last mile of the journey as something that would soon be over and forgotten. That's the first thing that changes the Christian's attitude to suffering to believe in a future in which suffering will have gone. And incidentally, before I leave that, those who do suffer in the next world, it will be entirely and justly and solely related to their own sin and not to Satan's or society's. There will be none of that kind of suffering there. And the final thing is this. Every Christian who approaches the problem of suffering approaches this problem under the shadow of the cross. Why did God allow himself to suffer? That's the question. You see, we don't believe in a God who, as the Book of Common Prayer says, is without body parts and passions. Don't know where they got that from. The Bible presents us with a God who suffers, a God who feels, a God who has compassion, a God who has bowels of mercies, a God who feels deeply for people. And we sang about that in the first hymn. But if ever the question could be answered, why does God allow suffering? There is one place where that question becomes its sharpest focus. It is at the foot of the cross. Why should God allow his own son who lived a perfect life of love? Why should God allow his own son to suffer? And the interesting thing is that Jesus himself asked the question. My God, my God, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why? I have sometimes said to people who were suffering badly and asked me why, though incidentally, the people who ask the question, why does God allow suffering, are usually the non-sufferers. I've not often had this question from the actual sufferer, usually from the relatives, but sometimes a sufferer has said, why? And I've said, did you know that Jesus asked the same question when he suffered? And they usually say, no. When did he do that? And I say, on the cross. One of the most awful things Jesus had to bear was not the physical suffering, though that was bad, but the mental suffering. He couldn't see why at the time. He'd seen why earlier, but now it came to the actual experience. He lost even the mental grasp of it. And he said, why, why? We now know that God had the very finest possible reason for letting that happen. 
that he was going to save the world through letting that happen, that the cross was to mean the liberation from sin and suffering and death for millions. But Jesus didn't know at the time. He knew later. And therefore, in the light of the cross, every Christian who suffers is first of all amazed that he doesn't suffer more, knowing that he's deserved hell. But he comes and he says, God, I bring this suffering to you. I don't know why you've allowed it. I don't know why it's come. But I bring it to you. And I bring it to the cross. And I believe that just as that suffering offered to you was used to save and redeem, that you can use my suffering to do something, something good, something wonderful. And when you do that, you find that Jesus is sharing the suffering with you. And that's perhaps the most wonderful answer of all. One day in heaven, you will no longer look through a glass darkly. You will understand as you've been understood. And God will say to you, I'll tell you why I allowed that to come. And when you see it, you'll be glad that he allowed it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the only thing that we need to know is that you know. And we believe that when our lives are in your hands, nothing happens unless you allow it to happen. We pray that whatever you allow to come to us through life, that we may use it, bringing it to Christ to weave into a pattern so that all things may work together for good because we love you and are called according to your purpose so that one day from heaven itself we'll look back and we'll see how all of this was used in your good power and purpose to bring about your will in us and through us and above all we praise you for the one who suffered for our sins and died that we might live forever. Amen.